and a fellow at the Asia Research Centre. And it's a great pleasure to have today uh, this seminar on the aftermath of the Indonesian elections. Um, and I want to give everyone a great welcome here to Murdoch today, uh, both those who are, here, who are here physically and our virtual audience um, over at ANU, who you can see over there. So a great big wave. They can't see you, <laughs> but, but they can see us. <laughs> So we are having, we're having a, uh, after, in the wake of our Digital Indonesia uh, uh, conference last year, we're, we're embracing digital, <laughs> digital Indonesia ourselves. Um, so today we'll be dissecting the aftermath of the Jakarta elections. Um, and it's been framed by some as Indonesia's own referendum on the liberal, in liberal democracy. As we've seen in elections, in established uh, democracies worldwide. But of course, there have been sort of peculiarly national dynamics at play, and we've seen some of the uh, polarizing dynamics of the 2004 national elections um, play out in this election. And this is, in many ways, the, the importance of the Jakarta elections has been reinforced as a way, as a as a kind of insight into how the 2019 national elections might play out. So we're here to dissect some of those political dynamics and ask you know, where to now for our newly elected uh, governor and his political coalition, uh, Anis Baswedan, uh, and for you know, Little Nemo, as Ahok called himself yesterday. <laughs> uh, before we kick off, I just want to uh, give a great thank you to the director of the Asia Research Center, Gary Rodan, and to Sia Kowalski, <coughs> who have done a lot of work to put this seminar together today, and for our collaborators over at the Indonesia Research Project, um, Pat Budi and Ibu uh, Nuken Muliani, who have also um, invested a lot of time and energy um, into bringing this um, seminar together today. So we want to say thank you very much to our friends at the ANU for that. Um, now to our speakers, and fortunately we have two scholars who have been following this election with absolute um, undying scrutiny. Uh, Murdoch doc, uh, Murdoch's Dr. Ian Wilson and Associate Professor uh, Marcus Mietzner from the ANU. Uh, Dr. Ian Wilson is a lecturer in security, terrorism, and counterterrorism, and a fellow here at the Asia Research Center, where his work focuses on Indonesian politics through the prism of urban politics and violence. Uh, he published a book last year with Routledge on the politics of protection records. Associate Professor Marcus Mietzner um, is from the, Asia, the ANU College of the Asian Pacific, where he's published widely on the political role of the Indonesian military and Indonesian political parties. Uh, Marcus publishes lots and lots of books, and his most recent being an edited volume on the SBY presidency. Um, today we're going to run uh, uh, a little bit differently from other seminars. Our two speakers will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll go uh, to questions. Uh, but at 11 o'clock, uh, we're also going to have take some questions from our ANU audience. So uh, let's turn now to uh, Associate Professor Marcus Mietzner for an overview of these uh, elections. Okay, thank you very much, Jackie, and let me just say how honored I am to share this stage with Ian, with whom I've had uh, a lot of discussions, very productive discussions uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, these discussions are not only, and that's the really interesting part about this, are not only about the Jakarta elections. You know, they are, and they are representing uh, a number of major conceptual, methodological, and theoretical um, approaches to the study of Indonesian politics. You know, there's, for instance, a debate about what kind of data do we use? You know, use of survey data versus ethnography and sociology. There's the question of class-based analysis versus a broader uh, approach, large end studies versus small end studies, and so forth. There's all kinds of really interesting uh, conceptual uh, problems involved here, and I'm sure you'll see this playing out today as well. Now, I've decided uh, to structure my brief introduction around some of the key debates that I see emerging um, over the last few days, especially since the election um, was completed last, last week. Uh, so let me start with a methodological note. Um, you will see me using a lot of survey data, and so this brings us to the first 
major conceptual debate uh, between scholars on the Jakarta election, and that is that precise uh, use of survey data, and in particular the question whether survey uh, institutes missed the amount of dissatisfaction with Jokowi by claiming that there was widespread uh, support for his performance as governor, uh, put it the other way, uh, did they overestimate, did they exaggerate the extent of satisfaction uh, with uh, Ahok's performance as uh, governor? Now, if you look at the uh, blogs in the last few days, that is one of the main debates playing out there. So one methodological note uh, before I get into some of this data, I believe uh, opinion polling is a science. Uh, it is, whether it's a social science or an exact science, that's another matter, but it is a science. It is one that we know produces uh, exact results if the methodology is applied uh, properly. Now, like with every other science, there are debates between scientists how to apply that methodology. There are charlatans, like in every other science as well. And there are very reasonable debates to be had what kind of approach, what kind of very specific uh, methodology produces the best results for opinion polling. But uh, what I think should not be happening is a general dismissal of survey data as unusable for political science uh, research, and I think that is what some of the bloggers have suggested uh, in the last uh, few days. So that brings me to the first substantive question, and probably the most important question in this entire debate on the Jakarta elections, and that is, why did Ahok lose? And that's tied to a sub-debate that we've also seen exploding on social media, and that is about the coverage of the foreign press uh, on these elections, which uniformly had headlines like, this is a triumph of the Islamists, you know, this is a sign of rising conservatism in Indonesia, this is the defeat of pluralism, uh, and uh, so on. So there's a lot of criticism towards that kind of um, approach. Uh, but the question for me is, what else could they have chosen as a frame for this election? And I think this is what we're coming into um, today. For me, the starting point, and again going back to uh, some of the survey data, uh, the starting point for the discussion of what caused Ahok's loss is that number of 65 to 75% of people who consistently in surveys said that they approved of Ahok's performance as governor. And I'm using this number in that range because it is undisputed uh, by the survey institutes. Every survey institute, whatever methodology they've been using, whether they were from the pro-Ahok camp or from the pro-Anis camp, whether they were done uh, during the campaign or on election day in the exit polls, all said the same 65 to 75% who proclaimed that they thought Ahok was doing uh, a good job. Now that leaves us with the fact that around 25 to 35% of voters liked what Ahok was doing, but didn't vote for him. And the key to understanding the outcome of this election, for me, lies in understanding this constituency. That's the mystery for us, that's the puzzle, that's the challenge for us to understand. The other constituencies aren't all that difficult to understand. You had around 30% to 35% of voters who said they disliked Ahok. That's about two million people or more. So it's not true, in fact, that they weren't captured by the surveys. Right? And they consistently, for very good reasons, voted against Ahok. So that's not the major challenge for us to understand. 
We also have the 41% who liked Ahok and voted for him. Also not very difficult to understand. But for <coughs> us, an analytical challenge here are those people who said, liked him, thought he was a good governor, liked what was happening to Jakarta in the last uh, three years, still didn't vote for him. Right? So that's uh, the challenge for us to understand. Then we have additional data. And again, the main question here is, is the framing within the religious context the right one? We have data that says that 58% and this is exit poll data, 58% of Jakartans did not want a non-Muslim as governor. We also have data that clearly shows uh, that around the same number, 57 to 58% believed that he was guilty of blasphemy. We also then, if we run the correlations between some of these figures, we know that the correlation between a vote for or against Ahok and the belief that he was guilty or not guilty of blasphemy was around 80 to 85 percent. So if we now look at the 25 to 35 percent of people who liked him but didn't vote against him and apply what we know about the religious question and what people said about their views. Adding to that, again, the very consistent data that Anis voters said that the, mo the primary reason for voting for him was religion. Either they said, I voted for him because he was of the same religion as I was. Or they said, second option, he defended my religion uh, most compellingly. If you take these together, a vast plurality or majority, depends on which survey you're taking, of honest voters said that. Now, if you take all of this together, the data simply suggests very strongly that the primary factor that drove these voters who supported Ahok's performance but didn't vote for him was religion. Right? So, so looking just at the data, and we can be as critical as we like of the foreign press in framing this election primarily in religious terms, I don't see how they could have framed it in any other way. Again, we're talking about the primary framework. Right? There's all kinds of other issues that come in uh, and, and, and aggravated our box predicament, but looking at the data, for me, there's very little doubt uh, that the major factor here was the politicized campaign of religion that moved these voters. Again, we're looking at the voters that said they liked him but didn't vote for him, that moved <coughs> these voters uh, to cast the vote um, against him. Now, one of the things that, and again, there's so much we still don't know, and there's still so much we can do with some of this uh, survey data that's available. What I would like to look at, and that hasn't been done yet because I don't have the access to the raw data, but looking at the exit poll data, of those people who said they didn't want a non-Muslim as governor, I would like to look at that and pull out the ones who actually said they were satisfied with his performance. Because that would give you a very good sort of quantitative grip on the number of people um, that were moved by religion as the primary factor. Again, we have the figure of an 85% correlation uh, between um, a vote for Ahok and the um, belief that he was guilty of blasphemy. Uh, but I would still not like to take that. I would like to uh, know very precisely, if we look at that number, uh, how many um, of those were moved by religion. The opposite approach uh, would be to simply look um, at you know, those 25 to 35 percent of people who said they liked him but didn't vote for him, and then look how many of those 
also said that they didn't want a non-Muslim as governor or uh, they believed he was guilty of blasphemy. Again, these kinds of uh, approaches would give us, I think, some uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, numbers. Now, the second major debate here, and that's been uh, very uh, fiercely carried out on social media over the last few days, is this issue of whether the politicization of religion was carried out by both camps in equal measure. Now that's a claim now made, uh, interestingly, uh, particularly from um, some uh, chi ethnic Chinese activists, um, ethnic Chinese scholars um, who have taken a critical stance on Ahok uh, for quite some time. Uh, and now say, uh, well, uh, politicization of religion happened, but it happened on both sides. Now, the tone for this was actually set uh, by Tempo magazine in its edition, uh, in the last edition before the elections, where basically they said the same thing. Uh, religion was politicized, but it was politicized uh, equally by both sides. Now, this is a claim I found analytically and empirically difficult to comprehend. If we look at dimensions, yeah, of course there was politicization on both sides, that's not the question. The question is, what were the dimensions of this politicization of religion? So on the one side you have the mobilization of hundreds of thousands of people <coughs> on the streets of Jakarta, partly with very disturbing signs like Hang Ahok uh, and so on. You had a very systematic campaign of exerting pressure on law enforcement agencies to criminalize Ahok over his remarks on uh, Almadia 51. You had a massive, massive social media campaign. Um, and if you looked at that very closely, again, very disturbing. Uh, very clear and deep ethnic undertones suggesting that Ahok should run for governor in Taipei or somewhere else, but uh, not uh, in Jakarta. That was one of the more friendly postings uh, you, would, you would find. You had the systematic use of Jakarta's mosques for spreading the message that whoever uh, voted for Ahok was uh, not a good Muslim, because uh, not so much because he was a non-Muslim, but because he was guilty of blasphemy. Now that label of Panista Agama stuck until uh, the very end. And you had, you know, all these groups that we know a lot about and, and, and Ian uh, knows the most about, uh, driving a very systematic campaign throughout the kampongs um, against uh, Ahok with the argument, which of course FPE had run since 2014, that you know, non-Muslim shouldn't be governor and so on, and it demonstrated at the time didn't really go anywhere because the normal population wasn't as interested in that as they were in the accusation of blasphemy. Uh, but they, from the very beginning, clearly didn't want a non-Muslim as governor, and they drove that campaign very clearly. So that's the dimension on the one side of the equation. Now, what do we have on the other side? in terms of politicization of, uh, of religion. And there we have a video uh, which very clearly backfired. Uh, in hindsight, we know that it uh, was a bad idea to try to throw this issue back on the other side and instead say, well, if you fall for these arguments of politicizing religion, then you are voting against pluralism. Again, we can all agree it was probably a bad idea at the end of the campaign. Uh, but I don't see much else in terms of strong evidence, and especially 
if you compare it to the dimensions of politicization of religion on the other side that would make for a fair comparison, comparison in that uh, politicization. So finally, uh, what does this all mean for Indonesian democracy and especially for 2019 and uh, the national elections? Now, the very well-founded fear I believe here is <coughs> that uh, this election especially the extent of Arnis's victory, 58% towards 42. I mean, a landslide that uh, not even Arnis would have expected in his wildest dreams, that this will now make for uh, a perfect blueprint for running the 2019 election. Right? They know now, this camp know now, knows now what to do uh, in order to attack an incumbent with ethnic, religious, or otherwise uh, primordial issues. Uh, and there's no reason that we should expect that this won't be uh, the case in 2019. Now, my prediction will be that obviously because Jokowi uh, is a Muslim, he will not be as strongly exposed uh, to the same kind of campaign, uh, but that is very easily adjustable uh, for uh, the other side of politics. I would expect uh, him to be framed as a communist, as a protector uh, of uh, Ahok, as a uh, blasphemous uh, incumbent in Jakarta, uh, as somebody who is a secularist. You know, he recently said religion and, uh, and politics should be separated clearly. All of that, I'm sure, Will be, uh, will be used. So that's at the national level where we can, from now on, expect a very tight and very tense uh, campaign. The schedule for uh, running those elections in April 2019 has just been released. And interestingly, uh, presidential candidates will have to be announced by August 2018, which is a much broader framework uh, in terms of timing uh, that we were used to in the past, and that means that campaigning for the nomination basically starts now, and it has started with Anis's uh, victory. Now, the interesting part about the dynamic that we have seen is, of course, now the <coughs> dynamic between Prabowo and Anis, because Anis is now, through this uh, compelling victory, a primary candidate for the presidency, as is Prabowo. Uh, by the very virtue of the fact that he is still leading the national polls of the anti jacobi uh, candidates. Uh, so we should and can probably expect uh, a very interesting um, discussion between Prabowo and Anis as well about who is most suited uh, to run against Jokowi, but whatever campaign and whoever is running, uh, I would predict it will be a very ugly one, and uglier than 2014. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Marcus. Um My take on this is slightly different. In some respects, the elections were something that just happened, and I've been doing other work in Jakarta for some time. Uh, on two fronts. The first was looking at uh, religious and ethnic militias, such as the Front for Islam, the Defenders of Islam Front, who became sort of moved to the centre in the campaign against Ahok o over the last few months. Uh, the other work I've been doing is uh, on urban poor politics and sort of looking at the ways in which uh, poor uh, working class and lower middle class uh, neighbourhoods in Jakarta think politically uh, and act politically and so some of the things I wanted to sort of reflect on today are coming from that perspective and one thing that's been been sort of really fascinating to reflect on and Mark and I had some really really uh, interesting discussions about this in Jakarta along with uh, some Indonesian scholars uh, and activists is thinking about not so much whether religion was a determining factor or not it clearly was uh, shift in uh, opinion polls towards Ahok the massive mobilizations the blasphemy case uh, all came to shape uh, not just the media discourse but the kind of polemics and rhetoric sounding 
uh, surrounding the whole election. So people were, were thinking about the election often in those terms, uh, a large majority of people. So what was interesting to me was to think about, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to think about uh, these political contestations, which have very concrete economic and material uh, impacts for particular sectors of society? What does it mean when these are framed in religious terms? Is it simply a case, as some of the discourses suggested, we're seeing any increasing conservatism, an increasing rise of populist identity politics uh, where people are identifying and forming coalitions politically along these identity lines. And I don't sort of offer, uh, I guess, a grand theory of all this. And I think we're looking at a, a city like Jakarta, which if you have Jakarta proper is around 12 million people. If you put that greater Jakarta, it expands out to 28 million people. An incredibly complex place. Uh, that from one neighbourhood to the next, and, and I've seen this in my field work, from one neighbourhood where you walk 150 metres, you've got very different sets of social and political dynamics. So again, I think it's, it's uh, I'm wary of attempts to provide a kind of an overarching theory uh, of all this. But some of the things that I've seen over time, which, which I'd like to sort of uh, maybe discuss with you today, is the instrumentality of using these kinds of identity uh, politics. Uh, I've focused in particular on um, neighbourhoods in the north of the city as well as some in the south. Uh, economically, these are largely uh, poor to working class, people working in the informal sector for want of a better term. Uh, and many of these uh, neighbourhoods in 2012 were some of the most enthusiastic supporters uh, of Njokowi and Ahok, who was at that time his deputy. <coughs> a complete lack of religious or ethnic sentiment problematising uh, the way they mobilised to support very uh, actively uh, in his campaign and also to vote uh, for Jokowi uh, and Ahak. And this is despite the fact that the incumbent at that time, Fawzi Bowal, uh, did try and invoke ethnicised and religious sentiment as part of his campaign. So there was at that time, certainly in these neighbourhoods, a sense that these would be uh, Jokowi in particular, but Ahok to a, a lesser extent constituted politicians who would have a new kind of engagement with uh, poorer uh, segments of, of Jakarta, uh, who'd felt, uh, certainly uh, over previous governors, that they'd been marginalised, they're only partial citizens, partial recognitions of their rights, living in a constant state of insecurity economically and in terms of their place within the city. So you saw many of them uh, voting enthusiastically at that time. And again, emphasising the point that religion wasn't a factor at this time. You had also, though, at the same time, this is another thing I've, I've looked at in my work, uh, a whole range of uh, vigilantes and militia groups, in particular the FPI, uh, from Pabila Islam, who've been active in these neighbourhoods with what I'm calling my, in my, my scholarly work uh, morality racketeering. So in some ways, some of the logics of extortion are that using religious arguments or religiously framed arguments in order to create pressure, to create points of tension whereby they could gain access to resources and leverage over politicians at all levels of government, uh, and, and this was sort of a well-established uh, practice. And what I observed over time, uh, particularly in neighbourhoods that, uh, in some ways, it's, it, as Marcus said, it's quite obvious that people weren't supporters of Ahok, because there was a great falling out. There'd been an expectation that evictions, in particular, would, would be ceased. And there was a political contract signed by Jokowi with Ahok, with urban poor groups, that evictions would no longer be used. Uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. And so many of these groups were very on, we were deeply hostile and antagonistic uh, to Ahok's administration. And, and I guess you could say that the sort of co-option of many kind of liberal and progressive groups within <coughs> Jokowi and then later Ahok's administration meant that a sort of a strata of middle class activists, there was a perception that these sort of poorer communities had been deserted by them. Uh, the political parties as well, PDIP, which had, uh, ended up forwarding uh, Ahok uh, as their preferred candidate for re-election. Again, there was a perception in some quarters that they'd sort of abandoned some of these complaints and that rather than having, I guess, a critical engagement uh, with politicians, that there'd been a polarisation quite early on, in fact, that it was a matter of supporting a candidate regardless of the, some of the impacts of their policies quite uncritically. In some ways, this left an opening for many of the kind of hardline groups, FPE in particular. Unlike many of the political parties, FPE that I've observed over nearly a decade now has well-established networks within many poor and working class neighbourhoods throughout Jakarta. And they've long been sort of 
niggling at these kinds of issues of ethnicity and race, in some ways opportunistically looking for socio-economic tensions over access to land, over access to employment, over access to representation, and trying to use those issues and turning them, giving them a kind of a sectarian uh, nuance which works to their, their effect. And as this sort of, I guess, tensions build up over time uh, and, and with the election campaign, FDE uh, sort of had their moment uh, in the sun in so far as this kind of instrumentalisation of identity coalesced with the interests of uh, the political coalitions who were uh, opposing AHO, uh, and this sort of found its form uh, uh, in what had earlier been demonstrations against AHO based on his identity. I attended some of these in 2014, early 2015, fairly small scale uh, affairs. But you saw this sort of building up of tensions in certain elements of the community. I mean, one thing that still remains a bit of a mystery to me is why so many lower middle class and then middle class Jakartans ended up joining in this kind of discourse uh, as well. There's an argument that materially they didn't have the same sets of grievances that poor working class people did, many of whom uh, were disappointed with Ahok. Of course, there are others who weren't, and this again comes down to the complexities of Jakarta in the socio spatial terms. There can be very different sets of circumstances from one neighbourhood to the next, and, and perceptions vary greatly, which makes, in some ways, the difficulty of formulating a kind of a, a grand theory uh, of explaining this. I tried to sort of speculate in a couple of things I've written recently to think about why these kind of groups were attracted to this sectarian framing of the election and were mobilised politically and, it seems in the end, electorally uh, along these lines. And again, this is quite speculative. I don't have access to a lot of the data and it would be very interesting, as Marcus has said, to see why some of these people uh, shifted, uh, it seems, their voting, despite having uh, in general satisfaction with Ahok for his performance, uh, to vote against him, it seems largely on religious grounds. And in thinking about that, I couldn't help but reflect on some of, you know, other things that have happened in the world, in particular some of the observations of the right, of, of populist right-wing uh, coalitions, the invocations of identities in ways that from, maybe from our perspective, are arguably contrary to people's material economic interests and how this has become such a very powerful mobilising force. So on one level, while segments of Jakarta were clearly satisfied with the performance of Ahok in a managerial sense, there'd be minor inroads, depending again on who you were and where you live in the city in terms of uh, infrastructural problems of flooding, uh, of uh, traffic congestion, etc. But whether that in and of itself was a sufficient reason for people to be engaged politically uh, with AHOC. And it seems in, in many respects that there's, I think there's a kind of a, a, a broader set of kind of dissatisfactions uh, with orientations to the economic development in Indonesia, growing wage inequality, uh, that may seem, uh, I guess, not find a, a rational political voice, that some of these kind of more uh, emotive uh, appeals to people, these pitches to people on, on identities really struck a chord that it was only very much later in the day, certainly that Ahok's campaign, they very much focused on performance, he'd been competent, he'd made these uh, policy achievements, and while on one level, okay, a lot of people would agree with that, but certain sectors of course not, that this wasn't really working, that there was something deeper uh, and more emotive that, that was really uh, appealing to people uh, at this time. I guess the blasphemy case in particular, in some ways I know in the communities where I've been spending time with, some were kind of had mixed feelings. Uh, they thought that Ahok was relatively competent, but there were other things that deeply unsettled them about him, in particular his, his manner of communicating. Uh, and in some ways this was reflective of, I think, of deeper sets of relations where uh, his way of speaking about Many uh, working class communities were often seen as, as not just rude and polite in terms of, of those cultures, but reflecting a particular kind of style of leadership that people had hoped would change. It was authoritarian, it was very often very paternalistic and patronising, and was perceived as very patronising, compared, and people would constantly compare this with Jokowi, who in some ways had the same kind of policies, he didn't make good on his uh, policies political contract to not engage in evictions, but his manner of communicating with people 
were seen as respecting them uh, and engaging in a kind of dialogue where they felt that they were being recognised as citizens uh, who had rights uh, and should be respected. And AHOC was seen as the contrary to that. And in some respect, when it came to the blasphemy case, a whole range of constituents who may have otherwise have mobilised to defend him, or at the very least to counter these mobilisations by Islamists, funded as it was by political coalitions, uh, had already been alienated entirely in that respect. These included a whole range of urban poor groups who have networks throughout the city. It includes some NGOs. He was very vocal early on in how human rights was an impediment to development in Jakarta. Again, a very new orderish kind of statement that, again, offsided a number of groups who otherwise would have been sympathetic to his broader uh, agenda. And there are also key identity uh, networks that he also alienated. Bamus Batawi, which is a, a, a kind of a Badangushiwara uh, Batawi. It's a body for Batawi organisations. Batawi uh, often identifies as the indigenous or ethnic group of Jakarta. Very early on, he'd offsided them by withdrawing funding to them and basically implying that it was uh, a corrupt organisation. There's probably elements of truth to that, but nonetheless, they immediately turned into a hostile political vehicle. And they, and they have a, a large representation throughout the city. So you saw these different sets of dynamics uh, at play where identity had degrees of instrumentality to it, not just for elites, who quite cynically, I think, captured onto the blasphemy issue and the identity issue, but also for other groups who'd been had a whole range of complaints, but felt that there was no other set of avenue for the pursuit. The PDIP in particular, I've heard this so many times over the last few months, many poor neighbors would say the PDIP sucks, they deserted us, they had this rhetoric of being for the small people, they're interested in elite games, uh, and they've sort of lost a grassroots level of support, and many of that's been sucked up, if not by Islamists, or Islamists working in conjunction with the coalition of parties such as Garindra from Prabol, etc., who very much targeted these kinds of areas in that sort of way. Um, I might just leave it at that, and, and we can have some discussion. Thank you. exercise the prerogative of the chair by uh, asking the first question and then after that we'll go to, to questions from our audience. Um, I had a couple of questions but I'm going to limit myself to one uh, in the interests of uh, time. I, I guess one question I have is, you know, to what extent does uh, now controlling the prize that is Jakarta scupper or throw obstacles in, uh, in front of Jokowi and the rest of his presidency? How is this a, a, a big prize for Prabowo in terms of gearing up for the 2019 elections? <coughs> and these questions are for both. That's more real. <coughs> I mean, obviously, since 2012, uh, in particular, the Jakarta governorship is seen as a stepping stone to the presidency. That's particularly the case since national media is. Uh, focus much on Jakarta and broadcast whatever happens in Jakarta uh, across uh, the region. That, remember, that's how Jokowi came to national fame. He started out as a local politician, but because of that extreme focus on Jakarta, he was, he, he was able to use that to propel himself to, to national uh, prominence. Now, this is what puts anyone who holds this position into uh, a slot where this can be potentially uh, be replicated. Uh, and again, one has to refer to the extent of Arnis's victory. Right? Uh, I think it would have been quite different had it been a 51-49 kind of affair. You know, people would have said, okay, he just scraped over the line, used dirty tricks to get there, uh, that won't you know, propel him much in terms of a presidential candidacy, but it is now the extent of the landslide. Um, the quite positive coverage he now gets from a range of media for this victory and his post-election rhetoric, um, <coughs> that I think uh, makes him uh, a very credible contender for, for the presidency. Now, the, the problem, again, for Jokowi is that he has tied himself so closely, and I think that was a fair assumption and a fair critique from Ahok's uh, opponents that the president was protecting Ahok. There's, there's no doubt about that. You know, he tried all kinds of ways to 
uh, to help him in this campaign. At the end, it didn't work, and that in itself is a frustration for, for Jacobin. You see, you know, all my presidential power, all my influence over the legal apparatus, all my control over the political parties. I mean, he really forced Petiga and PKB uh, to, uh, to support Ahok in the second round, and if the reports are true, he was the one who forced Megawati in the first place uh, to nominate him. So all of that, and still we look at the result, and it's deeply disappointing for Jokowi, and that reflects and bodes very poorly uh, for his 2019 campaign, and again, the sense of success that you have now within the Islamist groups who say, well, this is working. Right? We're talking about FPE and other groups who have been trying to do this for years. Yeah? They've been saying for years that Ahok should not be governor because he's not Muslim. Nobody wanted to listen to it, and now they found a way of effectively uh, doing this, which points to not, and I've said this in, in, in other contexts, I don't think it points to an increased conservatism among voters. It points to an increased capacity of these groups to swing elections, even if it's just about a relatively small constituency that's being influenced, that's being persuaded by these campaigns, it can uh, decide uh, close elections. And close it will be once again in, in 2019 as it was in 2014. So switching just you know these 5 to 10 percent of voters from a pluralist uh, position into a more uh, identity politics oriented one could do the trick who, for whoever runs in 2019. Yeah, I think, and sort of refocusing on Jakarta itself, Part of this will be if you reflect on Jokowi's ascension from <coughs> Solo to governor of Jakarta to president, he also was capable of selling a couple of policy successes. Uh, and, and I saw this sort of early on when I was looking at the early poor stuff, where some of his first things as governor were very much packaged uh, policies uh, that sold his competency. Uh, as, as able to do these things to, to a broader audience. So in some respects, I think uh, that would be the new governor-elect's challenge as well. Is he going to be able to deliver uh, on some of these policies? And I think one of the ones that was particularly popular, and this is despite all the noise around the, the identity stuff, was some of his uh, promises, quite populous in some respects, uh, regarding uh, affordable housing which in Jakarta is a significant problem, not just for the poor, but for lower middle class Jakartans where the market is, it's, it's in Australia and other places, pushing many people out of the possibility uh, of some kind of uh, home ownership. Uh, and he's proposed a kind of a, a, a zero upfront loan scheme and a run, number of other things which was routinely laughed at and criticised by Sir Ahok's can but nonetheless clearly appeal to a huge demographic who feel that the market itself is so hostile to them that they'll never have a chance of home ownership. So I think some of those key sort of populist policies, it will be important for him if he's going to be a serious contender, uh, whether he can sell himself as capable of doing these things. Uh, another issue which, again, in the context of Jakarta will mean one thing but nationally might mean another, is how he's going to manage the expectations of some of the hardline groups who campaign around him. He never uh, explicitly kind of, uh, I guess, condoned uh, some of the rhetoric that they were spreading, deeply uh, racist in some respects, uh, but at the same time he didn't come out and speak against it. He was happy to gain the popularity uh, that was coming from. So it would be a matter of, and I think for a national audience, where at the, uh, in Jakarta they're surprisingly popular and you know it's kind of a, a sort of a middle and upper middle class assumption that they routinely despised everywhere but in many neighbours people don't see them uh, that way. But I think for a national audience it would be uh, a test to see how he manages these groups. Because many people are concerned that the role played by these hard lines mean that they now have significant influence over the governorship. Uh, key concessions, people worried about you know, Sharia orientated bylaws, uh, the shutting down of the entertainment, and all of these sort of things, which are part of very much at the heart of Jakarta's massive uh, heterogeneous uh, megacity. So I think that will be another test. So you have to deliver some practical policy outcomes 
to at least sell himself as being capable of doing so, and also being able to be seen to manage hardline groups, which on a national stage I think makes a lot of people, particularly other uh, provinces uh, in Bali or Eastern Indonesia, are deeply uh, anxious about what this means. Okay, so let's go to questions now, and we'll take two questions and both points. Uh, <coughs> person, uh, and then Riley. Okay, um, you know, that was very, very interesting to talk, and I think it, it has raised the seminal, the seminal problems that we, we have to confront if we're to understand really what's happening. You know, I mean, I believe that we can progress towards and we have to progress towards some general statement about what's going on rather than a series of in unconnected empirical observations. And in that sense, I'm a bit skeptical of surveys and, and how they are often fed into analysis. Now, uh, Marcus, you said that by, by taking those people who said they approved of the way Ahok was ruling, but voted against him, you know, and, and with other data on religion, you could, you could bring out the point that the decisive factor was religion. Now, I think what we have to ask is, you, you can't just take religion itself. It has to be set into the sorts of political context that Ian was talking about. Let us suppose, for example, that Ahok's opponent in the election was a, a, a radical FBI candidate or, or, or sprouting a sort of ISIS line or even an ISIS candidate. Would, would Ahok have similarly been defeated by that candidate just because of religion? Well, I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because religion comes with a whole package of, a whole contextual package. And the people who voted it, uh, you, we must assume that a lot of the people who voted against Arpok didn't expect, expected that the, that, uh, you know, a, a governor coming in uh, with Islamic credentials wasn't going to do the same sorts of things that an FBI candidate or an ISIS candidate would do. So, I, and, and I think that, I w I w I've got it in, in another few points, but I won't. But I think that we have to be very careful of taking religion out of its context and just saying, well, religion counts. <clears throat> Different kind of question. Um, I'm just, I'm intrigued as to why both of you, but particularly you, Marcus, <coughs> Are, 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 are saying that these results are going to scale up to the national level for the you know that what's happened in Jakarta is 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 scalable because you know last time I looked you got really very regionalized patterns of support for different parties including the Islamist parties so I guess what I'm asking why why should Tell us why we should assume that this Jakarta result is going to play out uh, in a similar way. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just restate just for our audience over at um, ANU and um, apologies to our esteemed um, question uh, givers, <laughs> posers, who, whose uh, questions I'm going to mangle. Um, but uh, Dick's question was, you know, in what ways do the nuanced and localised context of Islam matter in this case for voting patterns? And uh, Professor Riley was expre expressing scepticism that Jakarta might be uh, a stepping stone for two presidents. Uh, oh, okay, uh, to uh, Richard's question, and, and Ian and I have discussed this as well, of course there is, number one, a significant question about to what extent dissatisfaction with Arnold Dan was channeled into religious rejection of him as governor, right? So I think the argument has been made, and I think quite compellingly, that previously uh, quite you know, communities that were unconcerned with religion or were unconcerned with you know, 
blasphemy case or were unconcerned about Almadia 51 or whatever was being cited by radical groups as an objection towards a non-Muslim governor didn't concern them. It concerned them once they were rejecting the policies, right? So there's clearly sort of a two-way <coughs> mechanism uh, where dissatisfaction feeds into uh, endorsing identity politics. The question here is, however, again, coming back to the survey, I understand you uh, are not uh, the biggest fan of those, but again, I've made my statement on that. Um, these people would not have then answered in a survey, yes, I approve of his performance. They would have said, no, I don't, or I would even suggest there's one category where they say, I really don't like him, Sangatidakuas. They would have identified themselves in the survey uh, uh, as such. Now, then the question again, and that's a big field, to what extent um, dissatisfaction, the evictions, the reclamation, <coughs> and so on, to what extent did that increase um, the religious rejection of Ahok? That's, that's a field that I believe we could also learn uh, a lot about uh, looking further at, 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 the survey, <coughs> at the survey data. Your second point about, well, would a, an ISIS candidate want? No. And that ISIS approach was exactly like that. They knew he needed the radical groups, so he went to their events, and you know, he had uh, Habib Rizik presiding over his victory party, uh, but he never openly endorsed them because he knew he would lose the more moderate uh, spectrum of the religious um, community. Uh, but that doesn't really go to the heart of the question of the extent to which the religious belief that a non-Muslim should not lead the Qatar was the decisive factor. And there I just would restate the point to you. Anis got 58% of the vote. 58% of voters said they don't want a non-Muslim as governor. 57% said they thought Arab was guilty of blasphemy. For me, these are not coincidences. And there we do know the correlations, which are up to 85%. That, for me, is pretty compelling. It may not be for you, uh, but uh, I think there's very little in ways of getting out of uh, the conclusion that it was, at the very end, this resort to identity politics that, that made the difference. Um, why is Jakarta an indicator uh, for, 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 the, for the national uh, contest that's about to be played out? Number one, it's a pretty good demographic average of the Indonesian archipelago in terms of its heterogeneity, in terms of its religious setup, even in terms of just the ethnic composition, you know, the percentage of Javanese is pretty much the same um, that, that you have across uh, Indonesia. So from that alone, it is a laboratorium and has been for some time of what's happening um, across the archipelago. But then again, uh, the other point that you know, media specialists would make is that you know, even in, in remote areas of southeast Sulawesi and so on, people are watching the news and it's all about Jakarta. And it has been basically since, uh, since Jokowi's rise. So it, it does inform very much the political views, um, the views of where people stand, what kind of uh, policies work, which don't work, what kind of campaign strategies work, which don't, um, and whether we like it or not, that would, will feed into the calculations of all actors for 2019. That's just my view. Um, so um, Dick's question. I mean, one, a couple of things that I sort of observed two different perspectives on this was one again was the instrumental use of the religious discourse and the mobilization around religion by a whole group of groups and people who had no real interest in it. So a couple of neighborhoods in the north very much involved in mass mobilizations around the blasphemy allegations. For many of those people it's the first time they'd ever been involved in anything like that in their lives. Um, the day after the election uh, where the result was clear, I was spending time in some of those neighbourhoods and saying, oh, so what about the blasphemy case? And they're like, who cares? It didn't matter anymore because ultimately from their point of view, the purpose of all of this had already been served, which was 
to get rid of our hog. Uh, and so from that perspective, there was just a, a, a kind of instrumental use of it. One thing that's, I think, less clear, but definitely uh, something that needs to be looked into is the, this disjuncture between that um, apparent sort of satisfaction with our hog's performance and the fact that larger groups of people didn't vote for him. I mean, on one level, you can explain it by saying, okay, uh, there's increasing kind of conservatism and this sort of identification, people can vote uh, along those lines. But if you sort of interrogate some of the discourses that you saw coming out of sermons, coming out of all the social media stuff, I'll sign up to some of these uh, WhatsApp groups, which are really significant sources. In some cases, almost the sole source that people have for information, conspiratorial stuff in particular. And the uh, Islamic identity was intertwined with discourses that uh, included racialized critiques of neoliberal capitalism. That it was, you know, we see anti Semitic, neo Nazi stuff, it's all run by the Jewish bankers. But in this case, it was all run by Chinese capitalists, of, of whom Ahok was their champion. And so you had, in some ways, broader sets of dissatisfactions with the nature of things being channeled through this kind of discourse. So people might have been very satisfied with the fact there'd been minor reductions in traffic, flooding, and uh, bureaucratic administration. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they were more compelled by some of these broader discourses that intertwined uh, Islamic identity, but also more populist kind of rhetorics uh, about the state of the world. Uh, and so if you look at, okay, you can say it's about religion, but looking at how this was framed and discussed uh, is, was really interesting in that respect. And it was more than just that. Many of these religious discourses were very critical of democracy. Uh, that liberal democracy was this Western imposition. And this, there's been a, a grassroots movement in Jakarta and elsewhere in the country for nearly a decade now that's been opposed to pluralism and liberalism uh, as decadent, as inherently anti-Indonesian, and also anti-Islamic. And well, so, the Asian values debate 20 years ago. Was in, exactly in some ways, yeah. But now it's being mobilized by a kind of a far-right Islamist mm -hmm. So I think when we're talking about religion, yes, but what that means, I think, touches on a whole range of broader issues that need to be interrogated. Um, as for the scalability of Jakarta, I'm pretty much in agreement with Marcus that you know Jakarta is the kind of the stage uh, for these political dramas, and people throughout the country pay immense attention. I know from friends in East Indonesia were riveted by all of this because they see, uh, as non-Muslim Indonesians, they felt a lot was at stake. Uh, whether that's the case or not remains to be seen, but there certainly is a perception in many parts of the country that's, that's what Jakarta means. Um, it's 11 o'clock, and so I'm going to invite our ANU audience to pose two questions facilitated by, the, um, by Ibu Nuka over at ANU Project. Uh, so just bear with us when we haven't tried this yet. <laughs> Uh, uh, can you can you hear us? Uh, yeah. Can you hear Papudi? Papudi, just sign a sentence. Yeah, maybe come down. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, the yeah, thank you for the presentation. It is uh, an interesting one. Um, on the issue why Ahok uh, failed, uh, it seemed to me that he has swift the statistic and all this uh, uh, data survey has been showing uh, strong correlation between uh, religious issue and the way that people vote. Uh, what is actually uh, the main question for me is actually uh, whether we could uh, we could argue that the issue of uh, religious can be uh, come up exogenously, I mean, can be forced from, uh, or it is actually, there are some other explanations when religious issue can come up. So if you look at several of the literature, uh, typically when issue, when people vote for religion, and this is when you have a corrupt government. And when the government is so corrupt, then you go to this uh, religious issue. Second is that, well, when uh, income distribution is so bad, then uh, the media voter goes to uh, looking for uh, religious issue. Now, 
But if I look at the Jakarta case, this is a contradiction. Number one is Ahok is a good guy. So we don't have this free court of government. And so religious issue could come up. Extreme issue could come up. Second is that even if we are trying to argue this is the issue of income distribution, I do believe when I look at the statistic, income distribution in Jakarta is not you know, like extreme compared to some of the places in Latin America. That's what. Second is that the uh, program to basically support <coughs> the, the bottom uh, uh, population is actually worked quite well in Jakarta. So, so this is actually uh, well. This is my question: Is is this really uh, the the issue of uh, religious, you can just insert it. It doesn't matter whether you have coral or not coral, whether actually income distribution doesn't matter. All the other thing is this, this is just the issue that uh, Ahok team failed to promoting Ahok. Uh, so basically whether how much is the contribution of our percentage for team in terms of making this issue come up? Thank you. Thank you, Pat And did you have one extra question at ANU? Or? I've got two other, actually. Is that okay? Just, or just one. Just one. Can we get two more questions? Or one? Can, can we keep it quite short? We've already got a short amount of time. Right, okay. yes. Hi. I just want to follow up on Ali's policy. So uh, based on his past performance, what's your prediction for his policy change and what kind of government do you think he will be? Thank you. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. Just one more What's your take on the current extraordinary um, sort of guilty uh, <coughs> A sympathy for Ahok expressed with the, with the um, flowers and people taking on the city absence of power. What's your take on that? Where does that come from? Thank you, Jim. Myself, or Oh. Um, <laughs> about the whole question of, of income uh, inequality and class issues and how they interact <coughs> with the rise of the religious rejection of Ark. Uh, I actually think, again, we, we need to have some better data on this. For me, now the important question would be to establish, and I've tried to do this over the last few days, but was unsuccessful, what actually the number of people were in about mid-2016 in Jakarta who would have rejected a non-Muslim as governor and then take the 58% on voting day and look at you know, the difference between the two figures. Basically, how many people were attracted, were um, persuaded by this religious campaign, and for what reason? I, I fully agree, for instance, with Ian, that there are very strong reasons to believe that some people who rejected Ahok for other reasons then, you know, also express their dissatisfaction with him in religious terms. But we just don't know at this point what the percentage of these people are. Right? And one pollster I've spoken to and who has this data actually said the number of people who rejected the non-Muslim as governor fluctuated only between 52 and 60 percent throughout the entire campaign, which if you take that would have meant that Ahok was doomed from the very beginning even without the blasphemy case. Right, so, but that's where we need to have much better, better data on. The other thing about uh, the income distribution, as Woody said, you know, that, that you know, usually poverty sort of feeds into a sense of religious radicalization. That's actually not really what the available data set we have says, the 2016 um, LSE survey on intolerance, for instance, um, which is the most comprehensive 
what we have. And it was taken in April 2016, which is convenient because it was just before the start of the whole, what we've been observing, would not suggest that poorer people were uh, less intolerant, but would in fact suggest the opposite, uh, uh, confirming what, what Ian has said on the ground, has seen on the ground. In fact, there was a flipping of that in the last six or seven years, where in 2011, when the last time that survey was done, uh, you still had that correlation that poorer people were more intolerant, but in 2016, in fact, the tertiary degree holders, the affluent, uh, the better educated, uh, were uh, more, uh, more intolerant. So that whole link between um, dissatisfaction uh, within poorer communities and religious radicalization, I think, uh, needs, to be, needs to be questioned in, in the first place. Um, about Anis's uh, policies, what he's going to do. Personally, I think uh, that's probably what he is trying to figure out at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because again, you, you, you do look, and, and, and I agree there were some sort of nice little snippets in the campaign, but overall I think it would be a fair judgment to say that you know, policy wasn't the main platform of, of this campaign. That was the front, so to speak, but the operation on the ground uh, was, was, a, was a very difficult <coughs> one. Of course he will, you know, I think, and that's where he says now when he's being confronted with these questions, what are you going to do? His standard answer is, well, I'm only governor starting from October, so don't bother me with questions about my policy right now, because frankly I think he doesn't know. And uh, for the housing affordability question, for instance, that will be one of these tests. You know, that's why people say, well, that's what I liked about your platform, so <coughs> please deliver on that. And I can just say good luck uh, with a 0% deposit to convince people. I mean, some, some of the conglomerates are jumping on the chance to work with the new government and say, well, maybe we can talk about this. Um, but in terms of a coherent policy uh, platform, it will be very interesting to see. As far as I can see, he has no coherent policy on the reclamation. Yeah, he was switching back and forth between saying, well, I reject it. But then when he was pushed on it, he said, well, we may keep the ones that are already there. And I never said I rejected it, but I said we'll use them for different purposes. So very clearly, he was making it up as as, as he went along. Similarly, and Ian, I think, has a very good take on this in terms of the, the evictions. You know, he, he is very clearly focusing on some areas where he will uh, probably sort of establish a trial um, area to say, okay, this is how we <coughs> approach this kind of issue, and you know, whether uh, it's Pasaikan or, or another area that he sort of picks to showcase that he is approaching it differently. But I'm pretty certain that at one stage, when it comes to flood prevention measures or others, um, we'll see evictions again. I mean, Jakarta has been going through that for the last, I don't know, since Ali Sadikin, um, and I don't think the election of Anis will break that, that, that cycle. Uh, about the sympathy for Ahok through the flowers, I'm actually, you know, that, that was something where I actually felt sympathy for some of the criticism because these weren't flowers. These, these were really expensive, what do you call them, flower bouquets um, that really would require quite a bit of money to put up, which would, uh, in fact, consolidate that prejudice that Ahok was particularly supported by the rich and the upper, upper middle class. A different thing for me was the ordinary people who actually came to see him. I think you looked at some of those and, and they were generally you know, from lower classes, lower middle class, um, but the flower bouquets for me uh, were uh, a quite questionable sign of the kind of constituency that's that's supporting him. Um, to some about Woody's comments, I mean, I, I would dispute that the income gap isn't being, in fact, the, the data I've seen, in fact, it, it's huge. 
uh, and in Jakarta, uh, that's certainly the case, and it's manifested spatially in very distinct kind of ways. And if you see the trends in a lot of urban studies, scholars have looked at this over the past decade or so. Jakarta, that's always been an economically heterogeneous city, insofar as people from distinct social economic groups live in close proximity to each other. The trend over time has been that increasingly, as well as other large cities, where middle and upper middle class people live in exclusivist spaces, where they have less and less intimate social relations with other groups. And I think one of the things that's interesting to consider that has distinct political implications. And I think if you look at Ahok's governorship and the kind of uh, deep levels of support he had in middle and upper middle class and the kind of things that they wanted from him, an orderly city, uh, a city where you know the inconveniences to them were eliminated. <coughs> of course, they didn't want to sacrifice. They wanted the poor people to, to be bear the brunt of this. Is manifested politically in these kinds of uh, socio-economic gaps. Religion, I guess, the, the trick is. It, I mean, the, the tricky thing is it's not its own explanation. And so, what we need to look at is how it's used, but also what it means to people. Uh, these perceptions are really important, of course. Uh, in politics, and so uh, um, again, when it comes down to issues of material uh, conditions, you know, you could argue that the middle class in a city like Jakarta is doing quite well. A lot of them don't feel that, though. If they don't perceive that's the case, then their political decisions will be shaped by that perception. Uh, of course, we can argue that materially they're wrong, but you know that doesn't matter. Of course, when it comes to the stuff of, of policy, uh, in terms of Anis's poly policy orientation. I think, as I mentioned before, its key uh, <coughs> challenge will be to show his competency to key constituents. Uh, and certainly he made a big deal of signing a political contract with some urban <coughs> poor groups. The contract was word for word the same with the one that the same group signed with Jokowi in 2012, and they're well aware that this is a, a risk, but you know they felt that with Ahok, certainly his, his fondness for evictions, that uh, they had no choice. But he's already made overtures. I know. Just, I noted just yesterday that he visited some of these neighbourhoods. Uh, he was he embracing some of their alternative planning models. And my guess would be s the same way that Jokowi made sort of set examples that he used to sell himself. He'll pitch to certain constituents, uh, give these kind of ideal model cases in certain parts of the city. But for the most part, it'll probably be business as usual. I mean. The, one of the, the sort of key uh, questions that's been debated, particularly by uh, urban poor activists and, uh, and their supporters, is why Jokowi seemed to abandon his political promises to those groups very early on. There are those who are of the view that he was basically manipulating them, and there are those of the view that he had good intentions, but when he came to the realities of power and a city like Jakarta with developers, uh, the monetization of any available space at all is so intense that basically he, he just wasn't able to do this. And again, this is going to be the same uh, pressures that face Anis in regards to the rhetoric. So I think he'll choose very specific examples uh, and then hope that that will be get him enough political capital with key constituents to keep moving on. Uh, with the reclamation in particular, I mean, he was openly opposed to it. Uh, of course, that will seem on course for his first direct conflict with the National Administration. Uh, the former coordinating minister for Maritime Affairs, Rizal Ramli, uh, opposed reclamation and was removed from his office almost immediately by Jokowi. This is a project that the national government wants to be completed. Uh, and so the political tussle, uh, I think he's toing and froing is when he gets a sense of the kind of uh, conflicts that he's going to be coming. Uh, the flowers stuff, I, I, I agree with Mark, as I looked at some of the banners and, and, and you know, the people coming in and people genuinely emotional, who those who really felt, you know, really uh, felt endeared to Ahok and his efforts and, and a, a, a perception that, you know, he really sacrificed a lot in his job, particularly the blasphemy charges, but the reefs, I mean, they're expensive things. It wasn't kind of like, you know, your average poor working class Jakarta bring a thing of flowers. And, and I noticed because I'm, from my work, I'm hooked into all the anti ahop networks on social media and made a big deal out of the rainstorm that came through last night and blew a lot of them over. <laughs> Which of course, with the religious framing, of course, this was a sign uh, of what, you know, the great cars really thought of all this. So again, these perceptions uh, are very, very, still remain pretty polarized. You know? Uh, I can take two more questions from, from our audience. Yes, Ethan? Yeah. 
uh, I just wonder why, um, well, because there is uh, fear that um, hardline uh, Muslim ideology was polarizing in Indonesia right now, and then the racial and religious sentiments was quite in, uh, used massively, especially in the pilkada uh, for election. So I uh, just wonder why government or Jokowi now just seem like that, let it, let it, uh, let it, like take that one flourishing, the radical Muslim or something. Uh, is it like a, uh, is it like his way to secure his position for 2019 election, or just he just his tactic to uh, looking for the hardline organization that will be come up up uh, and then the targeting to. I mean to Makar or Kup Deta, Kup Deta, his government, her governance, because... Uh, I, might, um, I might just cut yeah. you off there if you can, just because we've only got 10 more minutes, so I might just take another question. Yeah, so just, just wonder, uh, in, in front of uh, the panelists, what's your view about this one? Why is Jokowi Why is Jokowi allowing, like, yeah. Jokowi allowing yeah. political Islam to yeah. flourish? Yeah. Uh, a second question? Yes. Uh, yes, to address two questions. Um, what do you both make of the Harry kind of alliance with... Uh, with Prabowo and effectively and his. Okay, uh, and that question was about um, Hari Tano's uh, alliance with Prabowo and Anis. Okay, sure. Um, I mean, in terms of the hardline groups, I mean, on one level, this is something, you know, the president can't just control this thing. These are movements uh, that are being both instrumentally used by his political opponents and this is the overtures to groups like FPE is not new, it's been going on for some time. If you look go back to Yuliono's presidency, the Democrats, many of them were saying, you know, the FPE is a partner, uh, that they you know they're a great organization, etc. So and Prabowo said this as well. So for a long time they've fostered these groups because they have a use value to um, whether they'll, you know uh, my uh, things I've written in the past show that you know that the interests of many elites with uh, groups like the FPE is not because they're switching to hardline Islam, but they see the utilitarian value of this framing of Islam as an ideological counter to move towards, say, more liberal forms of democracy. Prabol is not, you know, an Islam. I mean, you call Amin Rice the Ayatollah the other day, like the ultimate gaffe, when you've got all these hardline groups that are vehemently opposed to Shia uh, Islam. So there's kind of instrumentality. I think to it that, and he's kind of in Jogu in some ways is sort of flipped and flopped. The Makar cases, Makar meaning treason, and there are a number of people who were involved in organisation in mobilising against Ahok who were placed on charges of treason. I can observe from certainly, you know, my, my time amongst those groups opposed to Ahok, this was all seen as confirmation, basically of I think it was a, a political blunder. These were kind of political nobodies, Rapnasar Pai, some people might be. Uh, familiar with Sri Pindan Pumukas, a uh, political has been, uh, Al Qatar, who's the head of the Forum Umar Islam, who has some prominence, but again, um, politically, I think that's been a mistake because it's again coalesced this idea of Jokowi is hostile uh, not just to Islam but using his political power um, in ways that you know, people make the kind of ironic argument from authoritarian groups that this shows his authoritarianism. He's more like Suhartu every day, using Makar to try and silence uh, critics. So again, I think, um, I don't know if it's really answering your question or not, but I think those groups still are seen instrumentally by elites, and they'll be used in that, in that kind of way. As for Hari Tano, I mean, Hari Tano, again, in some ways confirms that point, where you see uh, an ethnic Chinese billionaire who's not just a business partner, partner of Trump, but a, a vocal supporter of Trump aligning himself with a coalition that's <coughs> arguably come to power on the back of racialized attacks against an ethnic Chinese governor and also critiquing him on his religious grounds. The FPE uh, and others were very incredibly conspicuously silent on Hari Tano's very open endorsement of Anis. In some ways, to me, that's the classic example of the instrumentality of these uses of these identities. I don't care because he's useful to them. He's got a lot of money that he'll pump into it when other sources are kind of dried up a bit, including uh, Prabhu's brother. Uh, and so, yeah, I think yeah, the, the interest of Tanao is it shows his instrumentality. 
Um, in, in terms of the question, why does Jokowi allow radical Islam to flourish and why does he not move against the radical groups, I think the premise of the question is actually wrong and it's not showing what he does at the moment. Um, you know, he clearly wants to cut you know, the ties between the radical groups and more mainstream Muslim organization, he clearly, if he had the political capital to do so, would want to move them, uh, move against them more systematically. But as Ian said, the social political reality is um, that you do have in various segments of Indonesian society quite significant support, even for FPE. Right? So we've run, you know, some numbers on that in the project I'm doing with. Wuhan at, at ANU, we've run numbers on FPE's popularity in Jakarta, and it's 50%. Right? So, so again, we see FPE often through that lens of a radical, um, despicable organization, which it probably is, but it's not the view shared by many grassroots uh, Indonesians. So, so Jokowi clearly at this point is running a trial and error project in terms of, you know, how can I stop this? Do I have to use accommodation? You know, an accommodation on the side of promising redistribution of land, for instance, to Basantran and Muslim groups, uh, redistribution of capital the way he, he's putting it now, accommodation in terms of constantly inviting MOE people to the palace, maintaining um, that uh, that discourse, constantly inviting Islamic parties uh, to uh, all kinds of meetings. So that's the accommodation <coughs> side, which clearly didn't work. And now, as Ian just said, he, he is actually using the coercive approach, which would really not suggest, you know, I mean, imposing all of these arbitrary uh, legal charges on Rizik doesn't really square with the notion that he's trying to somehow uh, become friends with FPE. I mean, I mean, it's very clearly that the government is involved in that criminalization strategy, whether it's the porn case now played out nicely uh, at the same time that Ahok is still finishing up his own uh, trial. You know, the accusation that he has insulted the Sundanese, the, the, the accusation that his secretary general, the FPE secretary general now, and insulted the Balinese, some militia in, in Bali, uh, all very clearly trumped up charges, pretty much in the same way that the charges against our were trumped up. That doesn't add up to uh, the idea that Jokowi somehow uh, tries to come to good terms with with, with the radical groups, but again, it's not working. Whatever he's doing at the moment is not working. The accommodation isn't working. The criminalization isn't working. Uh, what he has, uh, and you can look at it on paper, is a 58% landslide against the candidate uh, he supported, and a 58% landslide for the candidate supported by, by these groups. So whatever he's trying it is currently ineffective. But I have some sympathy for that, and I'm currently writing up a paper on that, because if you look at strategies of democratic governments towards populist challenges, it's a very tough area, really. Now, even if you look at France, Germany, Belgium, and so on, how they try to deal with populist challenges towards democratic legitimacy, there's hardly any approach where you could say it really is proven to be effective. It's often a trial, an eclectic putting together of various approaches. My criticism towards Jacobi would be if you choose what is generally in the literature called the militant democracy approach, and that means criminalizing anti-democratic groups, but in a principled way. If you say you are an anti-constitutional group, we are not allowing you to operate against our constitution, that's fine. You take this to court. You have judges going through a long trial, reviewing the evidence. You're not throwing a porn video at the leader of that organization. Right? So there you can see just how desperate uh, Jokowi has been with that particular approach. But again, it's a very, uh, it's a very, very difficult field, uh, and any democratic incumbent uh, would struggle with that, with that challenge. On, on Haritanu, I mean, 
no surprise there. He supported uh, Prabowo in 2014. I think the strategy is pretty clear. He thinks that he can become president, which for me in itself is a ridiculous uh, premise, but he clearly believes the only way he can get there is joining the people he thinks are the major obstacle towards that effort. Right? So if indeed he is running in 2019, of course he would face uh, charges, campaigns, ethnically uh, loaded campaigns, and he somehow believes that by uh, joining them in a campaign like in Jakarta, he would be able to fend that off. I don't think it's going to work. Everyone knows it's not going to work, but good luck to him. Uh, we've seen him, uh, you know, on the covers of, of Forbes and, and now the New York Times. He had an interview with the New York Times, which he told the world then on four or five Facebook postings, which uh, were spread around. Um, with, with quite interestingly ridiculous quotes as well, such as, you know, that uh, Anis was supported by a wide range of ethnic and religious groups. Well, you look at the numbers, clearly that's not true. So, uh, Haritano for me is not a political factor I would take seriously. He will be a footnote <coughs> in what's coming for 2019. But again, if that keeps him entertained, he's clearly bored with what he's doing uh, in, his, in his commercial activities, then, then that's fine for me. But uh, I, I've had probably 12, 30, 14 interviews in the last two months about the question, you know, will he be a serious contender? And the answer, either if it's long or short, is always no. With that, I think we need to, we've come to time. And so I'd like to ask to all thank our speakers for sharing with us their incredible research today. Um, so, but, put our hands together.